in the world of tomorrow, the brutal world of tomorrow, with uh, China, with India, with uh, the US, with uh, Russia that wants to become again an empire, we can only be safe and in security when we work together in, in, in one big continental organization. I'm sorry, the world of tomorrow is not a world of nation states. It's a world of empires. That is the brutal world of tomorrow. Welcome to The Rest is Politics Leading with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And our guest today, I suspect to most British listeners, they know him as that Belgian MEP who kept popping up on our TV screens during the Brexit debate. And fair to say, not a fan of Brexit and very much not a fan of the politics and the politicians who brought Brexit into being. But there's a lot more to him than that, because this is a man who was president of his own political party in his late 20s, who was finance minister and deputy prime minister of his own country in his early 30s, prime minister in his mid 40s, and a job that he did in a pretty difficult country to govern, Belgium, for almost a decade, almost virtually coincident with the time that New Labour was in power. And it's very, very, very kind of him to do this interview with me in particular, because I think it's fair to say that it was partly and largely thanks to my old boss, Tony Blair, that this gentleman did not become president of the European Commission. So I'm very exactly, grateful. Exactly, I'm exactly. I'm grateful <laughs> that he's here. And I want to ask you, first of all, Guy, are there any hard feelings over that decision way back when? Oh, a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I'm waking it up and I say, ah, Blair, 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 Blair. <laughs> he, <laughs> he blocks me, he blocks me. No, no. But in, in the meanwhile, I discovered something that is at least so uh, passionate uh, than be uh, uh, president of the European Commission. That's the European Parliament and European democracy. Uh, because yeah, without European democracy, a European Parliament, uh, there is no future for this continent. So... Um, uh, no hard feelings, uh, Alistair. No Good. hard feelings. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Well, we're going to bring you back to talk about your time in, in Europe. But if, if we can begin by just giving listeners, because we have listeners all over the world, a little bit of an introduction to... Belgian politics. Belgian politics, and in particular, some of the divisions between the Flemish, French and German communities and the way politics yeah. works in Belgium. How many hours you have for <laughs> 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 to do uh, an introduction in Belgian politics in five minutes? Uh, well, let's, let's, let's say the following thing. So... We have been created after the Napoleon uh, Wars and after the Congress of Vienna as one of the first countries who went against the outcome of the, of the, of the Congress of, of Vienna. Uh, there are two countries. Greece was created at that moment in the 20s and we in 1830 with, in fact, uh, different language communities. Uh, I have to say we have the ability, I think, in Belgium uh, to find compromises and to uh, keep together uh, what in other parts of the world would already be have been separated for for decades or for centuries. Does it make it harder to govern Belgium, the, the fact that you have these languages? It's not easy. It's like an intergovernmental conference on a daily basis, uh, Alistair. Uh, an intergovernmental conference on a daily basis where you have to make uh, agreements, compromises, not only between political parties or inside the political party, but also uh, between communities. And it's a federal country that became federal after it was, first of all, uh, a central uh, country. So that's that's the opposite way of history. Uh, normally, uh, you have uh, uh, different uh, countries coming together and, and making a federation. That's the way it normally were. We did the opposite uh, from a, a central bureaucratic uh, 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 country governed by Brussels. We went to a federal uh, country. And in fact, yeah, with all the difficulties, it works because we have no war, we have no casualties, we have no violence between the communities. And, and yeah. Can I just come in just to take people back to the basics and my understanding of it? So my understanding is there are broadly speaking three main communities. There's a Flemish community, which speaks 
a language closely related to Dutch. You no, know, it's Dutch. It's the same as Dutch. It's the same as Dutch. No, no, you have to know there is one language community between the Dutch and the Flemish. So it's an international language community. We have a, a common vocabulary and a common grammar. It's a, it's a Dutch-speaking community, a French-speaking community, and a German-speaking community. Yeah, the German-speaking community is yeah, teeny, 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 and came after the Second World War. Yeah. Um, Very good. And traditionally, people perceived that there was a big domination of the Walloon French-speaking community economically and politically. And the, the Flemish-Dutch-speaking community felt more marginalized back in time. And Belgian politics partly reflected these divisions. So when you began as a politician, you were associated more with the Flemish community. Is that correct? I live in Ghent. So my native language, uh, my mother tongue, uh, as you say, is Dutch. But automatically you need to, for example, when you are prime minister and there is a, a member of the French speaking community putting a question to you, you have to respond in French. Right. And if it is a German representative, you have to respond in German. So that's that's the way it works. And it's true that in the beginning, uh, there was uh, yeah, a, a French-speaking domination, not only in the southern part of the country, also the elites, for example, in uh, cities like my city in Ghent and Antwerp spoke French. And that changed completely between the two world wars and after the Second World War, because there is a majority of Flemish-speaking people. In, uh, in, in, in Belgium, huh? so it's 60%. And going back in time, traditionally, m this is a generalization, but most Flemish speak people voted for Flemish parties and most of the Walloon French speaking community voted for Walloon parties traditionally, is that right? There was no, a... they're, they're, because there are no federal parties uh, in, in Belgium. So there is a Flemish liberal party where I belong to, like you have a French speaking liberal party. There are two separate parties. They are the same family. They are working together. They will be normally always together in government, but they are separate parties. And so that is one of the, the difficulties of policy making in, in Belgium, that is, that is a federal country without federal political parties. That's quite unique. We'll definitely come on to your views of federalism in the, in the broader European context. But first of all, can we just wind right back to the beginning, just to give us a sense of your childhood, who your parents were, what your influences were, and when you first decided or realized that you were probably going to be a politician, who's now been 50 years in active politics. When I was young, 12 years or 30 years old, I was already talking about politics, uh, discussing with my, my, my father about politics, about uh, the Vietnam War, eh? because that was then the main uh, topic. Uh, who is responsible uh, for it? The, the communists or, or the Americans? The death of Kennedy, uh, who is behind it? When I was 50, 60 years old, I said, yeah, I want to become prime minister of my country because I want to change things. So when you were 15? Yeah, already then. It's crazy. It's crazy. But uh, when I was really... Uh, at uh, before I went uh, to university, you know, I was already uh, uh, involved and so on in the in the local section of uh, of the of the Flemish Liberal Party and and so on and so on. So I I didn't have so when people ask me well, what you do for profession, I'm saying yeah, I'm a professional politician. I I, I know nothing else <laughs> than to do politics. But let's be clear, politics is. Quite important. There are people now saying, well, politics, politics, dirty business and so on. We don't want it. But the reality is exactly the opposite. There is no normal uh, governance possible of a, of a society without politics because you have to make choice. Otherwise, it will be the jungle. So politics is quite an interesting thing to do, I think. What What is the advantage and what is the disadvantage of having only been a professional politician? Well, I think you can have really uh, a focus on, on, on what needs to change in society. I did politics to gain power and power, gaining power in politics is a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. So people are saying, ah, you're certainly in politics because you want power. And I'm saying, yes, I'm in politics because I want power, because power is the only way to change things in society. If you are in politics and you say, I'm in politics, but I'm not there for power. Why are you there then? For the money? Uh, be for uh, for yeah, the, the protocol? For the 
So the, 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 if, if a politician tells you, I, I, I want to go in politics, I am in politics, but not for the power, then, oh, take, uh, put him aside, because that's not uh, what, what politics is about. Politics about is about gaining power and trying to use that power. Tell us what you think your strengths and weaknesses are as a politician. Which part of politics are you really good at and which parts of politics are you less good at? I am stubborn, so I start with the negative. Uh, the no, negative that's positive. Sign. That's positive. <laughs> Perseverance. Perseverance game. Yeah, yeah, true. But you can be can be too much, you know, hmm. so that you make more enemies uh, than you gain ground in in politics. So that that that's certainly uh, one of my my weakest points. And then the other way, I think I'm passionate about politics, and I I, I think that politics needs to work a supply side. Uh, politics. So you, we, we know all. We all know supply side economics. You know, it was popular at a certain moment decades ago. Uh, well, I believe in supply side politics. That it is the politician who has to propose something to the public opinion and not to follow the public opinion. I don't like those who are saying, "Oh, you have to listen to the public opinion," and that's a good politician. No, that's the opposite. A good politician has a vision, a direction about the future, creates hope for the public opinion and can describe it, can show it. And people will follow you if they like you, if they, they believe in you. Politics doesn't work like most people are saying today. That's the reason why we have a crisis of politics. It doesn't work that people are waking up in the morning at uh, 7 o'clock and are saying, oh, I have a bright political idea about Europe, for example. It doesn't work like that. What you need are politicians who have passion and vision. That are all the two, the two key elements, in my opinion, to be a successful politician. And a successful politician is somebody who can change things in society, who can bring change and reform. Guy, you've had quite, for a Belgian politician, you get quite a lot of coverage in the UK media. It's gone through various phases. At one point, when you were a pretty tax-cutting, market-orientated finance minister, age 32. I think at one point some of I was a think, libertarian. I was a libertarian at that time. Yeah, yeah, and you were called, in Britain, they called you baby Thatcher sometimes. Maybe they called you that in Belgium too. And now you're this kind of, I guess we'd describe it as a sort of ethical, progressive globalist. Yeah. So just talk me through that. What happened? Yeah. That journey, yeah. I mean, you've ended up in a better place than you started. Let me say that. But how did you get yeah. there? <laughs> that, that depends. I don't know if... if, if uh, Mr. Stewart is in agreement with you, but what happened was my involvement in the uh, Rwanda genocide. So I was appointed uh, by the Belgium Senate to inquire in what happened in that most awful human tragedies that happened uh, in Africa. Eh? In our country, we hear a lot about Rwanda in relation to this nonsense yeah. about stop the boat. So what was, tell us about the Rwandan genocide. Yeah, uh, 800,000 people, mainly Tutsis, but also moderate Hutus that have been massacred, killed in the most brutal way by Hutu extremists. And uh, so 800,000 people were killed in two months, Anastra, in two months, in the most brutal way. Every day, these, uh, these uh, Hutu extremists uh, went, into, Interhamwe was their name, went into concentration camps, killing people with the machetes. First their arm, then their, uh, uh, their, their feet. Their, uh, so the most incredible thing. I went there as a representative of, um, of uh, the, the, the Belgian parliament because uh, we believe that there were mistakes made by the Belgian government, uh, by the international community, by Kofi Annan, not to name him, uh, in, in managing that. Uh, they know in advance that a genocide was in preparation. That was the key point. And they did nothing. Uh, to avoid it. And, and how did that change you as a politician? I went there. I, I was there uh, just after the, a few years after uh, the genocide. And I, I went into a church and churches and with all bodies, with bones, totally alone. And I, and I came to, to a conclusion. And my conclusion was, yeah, there is more in politics than the deficit, you know, than the figures then, okay, I need to reduce the, uh, the, the, the deficit, the current deficit of Belgium. And that, that's a huge task, I can tell you, uh, to reduce it to a certain amount uh, and to lower it. There is more than that. And what is more, 
There are values, there are principles, there is human dignity, there is the, the existence of humanity. That's the important, and that's far more important than all ideological battles that you can, uh, that you can have and, and battles between political parties that you can have. So that changed me completely. So I came back uh, from Rwanda, I went a few times there, and then um, yeah, I did politics in another way, and I became prime minister, what never happened before. <laughs> Uh, and I started with the government, with socialists and greens. And the first thing what I did was to return to Rwanda, to Kihali, uh, to say sorry and to, to say, yeah, we are, we are responsible for the, the, the most incredible suffering that you can see in, uh, uh, in, in, in human history. 800,000 people, Esther, in two months in the most brutal way. It's a genocide. Uh, at the moment where everybody was saying, ah, oh, well, it may never happen again. It will not never happen again, but it happens again and again and again. One challenge that every uh, country in the West faces is coming to terms with its history. In Britain, the British Empire, in America, the legacy of slavery. Mm. In, in Belgium, of course, the Congo. Yeah. And I'd be interested, how do you talk today to a modern generation, to young people, about what Belgium did in the Congo, what kind of responsibility you have, how do you teach it in schools, how do you deal with this issue? After Rwanda, and after the fact that we apologize for Rwanda, we started also to look into, in, in, into our, our role in, in Congo. That's something uh, very new, in fact, in, in Belgian politics. Uh, we have an inquiry committee that had made conclusions. Uh, that have also made apologies uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, to Congo and the Congolese uh, people and to yeah what happened in history uh, the the role of of Leopold II and so on. I don't know if you were speaking to I don't know you, I don't know whether you have a grandson or something but they asked you what did Belgium do in the Congo what would you say today how would you explain the situation I, I think. Uh, colonialism uh, everywhere in the 19th century is the most awful atrocities that uh, that you can imagine i don't think that we can imagine today in the in the in the beginning of the 21st century what really happened at the end of the 19th and in the beginning of the 20th century in every colonial power being the dutch there be the belgians there be the brits there be the french there incredible maybe the the only exception i would make is the portuguese because they had a little bit another way uh, of looking to uh, uh, to the, the territories that they discovered. And they mixed themselves with the local population. But we, I, I think we, we uh, our, our, yeah, our grand-grand-grandparents uh, were responsible for a, a, a colonial period that is uh, maybe the most awful uh, that uh, uh, time in history that you can imagine. Guy, we don't need to spend too long on this because we will talk about British politics more in the context of Brexit. But uh, I'm sure you've followed the the situation regarding Rwanda in the current debate in the UK about immigration and this stop the boats obsession which the government has and this desire to send what they call illegal illegal uh, immigrants to Rwanda. What 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 have you been making of that? I find I find it an awful idea that you're gonna. Uh, you put your problem with uh, asylum uh, seekers and and and, and uh, migration uh, towards uh, an African country. Even uh, I, I find that the most awful idea that you can have. Uh, in top of that, I think that uh, a lot of the problems in the British recent history on migration have something to do with Brexit. Sorry, uh, I see the figures. I can look to the figures as you can look to the figures, and everybody can see them. That is, that there is an enormous increase in illegal migration since Brexit. And what's your understanding? I mean, why are people leaving France, which is a safe country, in boats to go to Britain? Why, why are 40,000 people a year doing this? And why? Yeah, because for historical reasons, for the fact that they have already family living there. Most of these people are saying, I want to go to Britain. Why? Yeah, I have a cousin already living there, or uh, I have a link with that, uh, with that country. Uh, there are, so, and, and the only way to, to tackle that problem is, in my uh, opinion, is on a continental scale, uh, is, on the, in my opinion, on a European scale. 
uh, because the problem is not a British problem alone or a French problem alone or a German problem alone. But if you put yourself outside the system, then it's far more difficult to, to manage it. So it's, it's very ironic that uh, Brexit uh, came because the Brexiteers used migration and illegal migration uh, in saying we have to cut it. And then the result of it is exactly the opposite. So that's the reality. But, but, but Guy, I, I guess the, the issue that, that I'm trying to get at is um, the question of, I mean, and I, I quite like the proposals that the Labour Party has made, that Keir Starmer's made. His proposal is to say we should not be accepting people from France. Instead, we should take genuine asylum seekers, people who are you know, female judges from Afghanistan, people who are at genuine risk to their lives. We should agree a quota with Europe, and we should take however many, 25, 30,000 people to Britain who are genuinely at threat. But we do not have an obligation to take people who are coming from a safe country. This is not what the asylum system exists for. That's true, but the asylum system everywhere, not only in Britain, but in also in the rest of Europe, is abused, naturally, because there is no legal migration routes. So if there are no legal migration routes available, what people try to do is to abuse the existing asylum route. That is what is happening. And uh, so the first way to tackle uh, this uh, illegal migration is to create and have the possibility of legal migration. That's the first thing to do. And the second thing to do is to organize yourself at the outside borders of Europe and the European Union. I'm always asking myself why it is necessary that you have to come into Europe to ask for asylum. Why somebody who was really persecuted in his country cannot ask for asylum in a consulate of a European country? Why it's necessary that you jump into the arms of uh, yeah, the, the smugglers to come into Europe maybe to lose your life before you can ask for asylum. That's completely crazy. So we have a system of non-existing legal migration that push people into asylum uh, schemes. And it's asylum, you can only ask for it if first of all, uh, you pay a smuggler uh, to arrive in Europe. So we have to really completely revolutionize this. And that has to be done, I think, by, by all European countries and together, yeah, Britain and 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 Europe together. Um, just just before we leave this one, you've been a politician for literally for half a century, and you've witnessed many, 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 many political leaders. Um, I'd just like your assessment of what you think has happened to our politics that we had Johnson, then Truss, and now Sunak, who, unlike you, has only been a politician. For a few years, I'd just like your assessment of them before we get onto Brexit. What's your assessment of them as leaders? Yeah, you have, in general, naturally a crisis of politics. It's not a unique uh, British problem, but your electoral system makes it uh, more uh, more visible, uh, more uh, how to say acute. Uh, your the, the the crisis of politics that you see is everywhere in Europe, but you see a a very sharp uh, yeah, image of it or uh, representation of it in Britain, I think because of the electoral system, huh? because of, it's an electoral system uh, who is in fact give to a minority huh? the possibility to govern for a majority. That's, that's, that's what is happening. And I have seen that in, in Brexit nearly every day, every week, every month. We from the continent, we from the European Union, we tried to have a compromise uh, where there was an exit, a Brexit, but not a hard version of it in saying, yeah, maybe it's good to stay in the single market because the single market has been invented by whom? By Margaret Thatcher. So maybe it's not a bad idea huh? uh, to stay in the single market and not to cut you off from your main market as happened with Brexit. That was our idea right? because we know very well that there was a majority during this referendum. So we need to, to be to be serious about, uh, about that. And we pushed both sides, the moderate conservative, the conservative party led by Theresa May and uh, Liddington and, 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 and all these people. And we pushed also Starmer, who was the responsible uh, uh, of Labour mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for the Brexit. Yeah. We pushed them to make an agreement, to have a, a common understanding of the Brexit they want and was possible. And we, would, we, we pushed them. And every time we saw that it was impossible 
putting Starmer and Lidington together, what they did a few times, never materialized in a compromise. Never. Because the British politics doesn't work like that. That was also the stupidity from the Remainers during this whole period when they pushed <laughs> for uh, an election, a parliamentary election, uh, at the request of Boris Johnson, and, uh, thinking that it would be a referendum about Brexit. That's not nonsense, naturally, because the electoral system of Britain is absolutely not a referendum. It's a first past the post. You, you know it better than I do. So, uh, and and so what I saw was that uh, uh, besides the general crisis in politics that we see, and we can talk about it because I think uh, our social media play an important role in that crisis for uh, the moment. What we saw is 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 a country that yeah classically with first past the post works uh, uh, opposition majority, and they will never could never work together, while the interest of Britain at that time was that Labour and the moderate Conservatives worked out a compromise with us. That was, in fact, the interest of, of the UK at that moment. And they could not do it because of the electoral and political system. So, Guy, I mean, I'm very sympathetic towards moving to more of a proportional representation system. But sometimes on the podcast, we discuss the other side of that. You know, we worry that, in fact, the proportional representation system gives space to the AFD in Germany, to the Swedish Democrats, to what's happening in Finland. And not in Britain, you're the first past the post. In, in a few times now, in a few months now, maybe Farage will be on the list of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party have become, I will not say completely the AFD in Germany, but is in extreme water, no? I'd say they're closer to the AFD than they are to the old Conservative Party. That Roy exactly. Part if, if you see what they are saying about migration, well, there are many uh, populist right-wing parties who are more moderate than the Conservatives for the moment I, in I, Britain. Guy, I, I, would, I would say they're very, very different to the AFD. I'm not sure. Right, maybe, maybe not the AFD, but I say it in general. The marches of hate, Rory. Homeless people, lifestyle choice. There's a wonderful conspiracy going on here. They're not the AFD, and I think that trivializes the horror of the AFD. He said they were closer to the AFD than to the old Tory party. No, I think we have to be careful. Rishi Sunak, James Cleverley, David Cameron would not be welcome in the AFD. This is, an, this is a, a, a very, very, a very danger, dangerous comparison. No, but they're, welcoming, but they're welcoming Farage back to the Tory party. That's the point he's making. That's my, that was my point. That was my point. I think actually it's very dangerous because, in fact, you normalize parties like the AFD by suggesting they're just a version of Rishi Sunak. And no, David I'm Cameron not saying that. I'm saying, Roy, listen to what I'm saying. I said, and I think this is what Guy is saying, that the, we, we pride ourselves on not having these right-wing populist parties, but we have a right-wing populist party in government pursuing policies. This is what this Braverman thing is all about, in part to... Be part of. She, she, she's not in government. No, but she's running the government from outside it right now. Otherwise, why was he doing a press conference at 11 o'clock to respond to her? Anyway. Look, there is no European country uh, for the moment uh, making a deal with Rwanda or whatever uh, uh, African country. That's the point. Mm. Mm. What about, let, let, let's just go to, just very, very briefly. I, 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 this is because you've been a prime minister. You've studied prime ministers. Johnson in a word, Truss in a word, Sunak in a word. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, in fact, I never met uh, Truss or uh, Johnson as, uh, as, uh, as prime minister. So I met Truss later on when she was not longer prime minister in, uh, in one or other uh, meeting in Japan or relationship with China. I had a lot of admiration, I have to tell you. Uh, for uh, for uh, Theresa May, uh, because uh, uh, with her I got m a few meetings, so and and she stood, understood very well, and and her attempts were very, I think, serious, uh, and unfortunately they did ma materialize uh, her attempts to have an agreement and the majority in, in the British Parliament. So and then David Cameron, yeah, I think he did the stupidity to do a referendum about the EU, and the stupidity mm. is also that in 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 principle based on, on the British constitution, it's an advisory referendum. But yeah, advisory referendum doesn't exist naturally. Uh, if you organize a referendum, you have to, to, uh, to, follow, uh, to follow it. Mm -hmm. So, but um, in most, when I was a Brexit negotiator for the European Parliament, my relations were with uh, the people uh, surrounding Theresa May and Theresa May herself. And that was, uh, 
I have to tell you, very positive. Like I have also very positive uh, feeling about Starmer, who was then the, the representative of Labour uh, for the Brexit negotiations. The only point, and I point, I, I said it already uh, during the uh, the uh, our, our interview, uh, is this incapacity uh, in British politics uh, for both sides uh, to to make uh, an agreement or a compromise on a question so existential for a country as uh, are we in or are we out the EU? And if we are out the EU, what is our relationship with the EU? Even in Belgium, I have to tell you, <laughs> even in Belgium, um, with all our differences and with all the tensions we have, we would make a, a, a compromise between the different political parties so there is one a solid uh, uh, attitude and opinion and strategy uh, uh, from our country towards such negotiations. And that didn't happen in Britain. And the, the, the other thing where I think you do have a certain locus in being able to comment on this, which is about Britain, is our media. What Because you get a fair bit of flat from our media. I was looking at some of the coverage of you in The Sun. You're a uh, detestable, blabbermouth, European, superstate, federalist. What do you see in our media? What do you see in our media culture? And what, do you, what influence do you think it has on our politics? Naturally, I'm, I'm not very objective in, in, in that sense that so I read The Guardian or The Independent, but I don't think that there are many other people who doesn't read uh, The Guardian uh, the, or the FT or The, uh, or the Independent. Uh, so, and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, things that I have seen in, 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 in newspapers like The Express, for example, is, yeah, is, is, is awful and is not, uh, is not the reality. So they, they are talking about the super state Europe. Uh, you know what the super state Europe is. The super state Europe is um, 1% of European GDP. That's a super state Europe, 1%. The American federal system has a budget of 25% of the American GDP. The Swiss Confederation, not even a federation, has a budget of 15% of the uh, Swiss uh, GDP. We have 1% and everybody's talking about the super state. The reality is that in the world of tomorrow, the brutal world of tomorrow, with uh, China, with India, with uh, the US, with uh, 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 Russia that wants to become again an empire, we can only be safe and in security when we work together in, in, in one big continental organization. I'm sorry, the world of tomorrow is not a world of nation states. It's a world of empires. That is the brutal world of tomorrow. You're a very, very skilled politician with a very thoughtful, sophisticated view of the world. But you chose to, in the Brexit discussion, become famous for making very provocative comments about Britain that upset a lot of the British population through the media. Well, give me an example of such a provocative uh, statement. Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being unfair. But the perception, strong perception, Guy, was um, that, 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 that you had contempt. And and I think that's and that's and that's why, and that's why these questions about what do you think about Boris Johnson, what do you think about Brexit, are being asked, because because and, and you know Alistair is believes like me that you have profound contempt and you express that contempt. I don't think he has profound contempt from Britain. I think the I think the the perception was created by people saying that he had exactly. It. I don't. I don't think that there was ever provocative uh, towards uh, British politics on the country. I. I. I, I love uh, to follow British politics and British culture and British. You know, I have a, a number of hobbies, and one of my hobbies is, is racing with British cars. So I, I like Britain. I love Britain, but. The fact that I'm attacking, for example, I'm very provocative to Nigel Farage, for example, in the European Parliament, to to other uh, hardline Brexiteers. That's 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 a difference in opinion. That's a difference of point of view. That has nothing to do with uh, with uh, uh, provocation. No, but I'm I'm just sort of trying to understand the style. I mean, so you called one of my colleagues, for example, a wanker. Now that must be a deliberate decision. So why is it that you? I mean, I'm I'm just interested in what was your audience? What were you hoping to achieve by doing that? I mean, you're a professional politician. You don't do this by accident. So who was your constituency? Who were you appealing to? What were, you, what were you hoping to achieve by doing that? My, my, my constituency is always the same. It's, it's, uh, it's my constituency in, in Belgium. Huh? So that's uh, Flanders. Huh? That's my constituency. And secondly, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, we tried to, to find a compromise on Brexit, keeping at least uh, the UK into the single market. 
that was our, our goal. And that would have been good and for Europe and for Britain. Let me, let, let me explain the, the, the issue, right? I, I was on your side on that, right? I was on the moderate side. I was very supportive of David Liddington, Theresa May. I was trying to push very hard to get customs union votes through, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, right? But it wasn't made easier by the perception that you were calling colleagues of mine wankers. I and understand. I'm interested in this because you seem to me such a thoughtful, interesting person. Why do you do this? You think it's fun for your constituents? You think it's going to catch media attention? You have a bad temper? I mean, what, what's what's happening here? We should, we should say for the listeners that the, the, the wanker in question was Andrew Rosendale, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's one of my colleagues, yeah. Uh, I don't even remember that I used that word, but okay, <laughs> it's possible that I did it. So uh, it could be, but that is not uh, the main uh, the main force that drives me. What drives me is uh, to uh, to to uh, get it right. And in in Brexit, that was to keep uh, at least uh, Britain in in a customs union and single market uh, uh, construction. And the fact that. And the fact that it didn't materialize has nothing to do with what I said of your colleague, but had to do uh, with the incapacity uh, of the British political system uh, to find an agreement and a compromise uh, uh, bridging the, the classical uh, divisions between opposition and majority. Sorry, that what does, that was my that's my firm conviction. Now, Guy, you're seventy. I'm sixty-six. Yeah. He become old, Alistair. I know. Rory's 50. That's a young guy. Yeah, he's a young guy. Do you think that Britain will be back in the European Union or something close to it in your, my, or Rory's lifetime? Yeah, I think so, because we're going to live long, eh? uh, <laughs> both of us, uh, because politics is not a bad environment to, to live long, I think. Uh, uh, and secondly, because I think it's, it's, it's clear. Uh, you look to the figures today, you look to what people are saying. I was in the Rejoin March uh, a few months ago the, uh, in, in London, and uh, young people are clearly in, in favor uh, to return to a union. What I hope in the meanwhile is that we can change the European Union in a better union because the fact that Britain uh, was exiting uh, the European Union was a failure for the European Union. If a country, a big country, an important country, uh, a powerful country like the UK saying we leave the EU, that was a failure uh, for, for the EU. And that was, a, 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 it's a reason for us to reform ourselves. And what was that failure and what, what reform? The, the fact is that, that, that Europe today, and you see it in every, in every file, uh, because of his bad governance structure, is always acting too little too late. That's the problem of the European Union. It concerns migration, it concerns the pandemic. Uh, we are talking about the aftermath of the financial crisis. We can talk about the war in Ukraine. We are acting too little, too late. That's always the same. Guy, is that is that not because the federal, the federal structures that can work for a, a population the size of Belgium that becomes much, much more difficult when you have twenty seven, maybe moving to thirty plus countries. No, no. Countries. The, the, pro the problem is, Alistair, there is no federal structure in Europe. That's the problem. It's an intergovernmental patchwork based on unanimity voting. So the twenty seven member states need to be in agreement. Tomorrow there will be thirty five or thirty six or thirty seven member states because Moldavia will enter, Georgia will enter, Ukraine needs to enter for our security, and we're going to still uh, give a veto to every of these members. So what is happening then, uh, that is that you cannot decide. Uh, for example, on sanctions to, to Russia, uh, it takes always months more for Europe uh, to decide than uh, for, yeah, for the US to decide on, on, on this issue. So the main thing to do in Europe, the big reform, is to end a veto system that is in and place. Guy, what, what would you like the European Union to look like in your dream in 30 years time? What, what would be the real dream in 30 years time for the European Union to look like? Well, a small uh, government executive, 15, 15 16 people, not, not uh, the big uh, uh, commission that we have today where the, you have a number of commissioners who have not even a, a portfolio. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, a, a union that that is based on uh, 
yeah, uh, a serious budget to, to manage the problems we have, certainly on defense. I think defense, for example, Robert, is one of the big scandals in, uh, in Europe uh, on waste of money. You, you know what, what, what we spent in Europe. We spent more or less 200 to 240 billion euros, so that's 210, 220 billion pounds on, uh, on defense without the UK. What, at the moment that the UK was inside, we spent nearly 300 billion uh, on, on, on defense. And you know what the Chinese are spending today? 240. We spent as the same amount as the Chinese. We spent four times more on defense than the Russians. But we are not capable to defend ourselves. If tomorrow Trump's come back in America and he decides to go outside NATO or to change NATO, so what he already said huh? uh, a few times in, in, in the past, there is no security in, in, in Europe. But we spent 240, 230 billion euros on it. It's the biggest waste of money. We do every time, everything, so, so, so 20 w- w- would you like? Would you like Would you like a much more integrated single European army? Yeah, a European defense union that I want. And that can be the European pillar of NATO. That would, that would make sense. You, so that you have a North American pillar, that you have a European pillar, maybe even an Asian pillar in, in the future with, with uh, countries like uh, J- uh, Japan and, and Australia, New Zealand, and so on and so on. But th- th- that is, that is uh, the, the, the way forward. We are not capable. We've spent four times more than the Russians, but we are not capable to support uh, Ukraine in a sufficient way for the brutal invasion they have to suffer from uh, from uh, r- uh, from Russia. That's the reality on the ground today. And more central control of the budget of the European Union. So in some areas, less discretion for member states, more control from Europe no, over and, defense and, no, of and, budget. And from time to time, also the opposite. There are, in my opinions, uh, uh, far uh, too much regulations on the single market that can return to the member states. A federal system is not a system, it's based on subsidiarity. You do it on the level where you can best do it. What you can do on the local level, you do on the local level. What you can best do on the on the regional level, you do on the regional level. What best is you can do on the national, you do on the national level. But where there is an added value to do it together on the European level, you do it on the European level. That's subsidiarity. That has nothing to do with super state. I know with super states, super states is France. Everything is decided in Paris. Super state are the Dutch, the Netherlands. Everything is decided in Den Haag. That's, a, that's, their, that's the, the consequence of Napoleon. Uh, okay. But a federal system is the opposite of a super state. A federal system says, no, subsidiarity is the basis. You do it on the lowest level possible. And if it is not possible on the lowest level, then yeah, uh, you do it on, on national, on the European level. It's absolutely not... Uh, uh, eliminating sovereignty. It's the opposite. It's reinventing sovereignty. What is the sovereignty today of Britain in managing migration? Zero. What is the sovereignty of France, Germany in supporting Ukraine? Zero. They are not capable. They need the Americans. Otherwise, it's not possible. So we need to reinvent sovereignty. And sovereignty for us and for Britain means sovereignty on the European level. If you are not capable to defend our interest on the European level, we will be whipped out by the Chinese, the Indians, the Americans. It's already the case today. Look to your t- the, 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 the digital infrastructure in Europe and the tech industry. We make the data and the Americans make the profits. <laughs> Guy, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, I'm loving the fact that the passion is still there as you go into your eighth decade on the planet. Um, and I know that Roy, as you know, Roy and I have both written books about the future of politics uh, this year, and you're working on one as well. So give us something optimistic about the future of politics before we go. Well, one of the points uh, that I will raise in, in the book uh, was inspired by your book, Alastair. Uh, the point about a, an individual, a citizen, can make a change, can change things. That was one of the topics in the book. Yeah, you remember that. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> and I think uh, that is true. That's the big thing that we have to uh, repeat. Uh, an individual with a conviction can make a difference. You look, uh, one of the biggest uh, men that I have ever met was uh, Mandela. He made the difference, you know? 
he ended apartheid because he had a conviction and he had also an attitude, a uh, great attitude uh, to, uh, to, to, make it, uh, to make it happen. Uh, and, and I can give you a lot of examples uh, uh, like that. Uh, Zelensky will make a difference, you know? Without Zelensky, this war was already over and not in the right way, not in favor of, of, of the Ukrainian uh, uh, democracy. So Zelensky make a difference. We make a difference. And so to, it's necessary that we ask young people to engage in politics because politics is necessary, but with politics you can change the course of history, of your country, of your local community. Guy, can I, can I bring you away from the, the grand to the particular, the how of politics? Give us a sense of one thing that you were successful in and how you did it, and one thing that you failed in and how you failed. It can be a small thing, but I'd like to see more of the, the practical skill of the politician, where you feel you were skillful, where you felt you were less skillful, and what lessons you I, had. I, so I can now start about uh, uh, the budget we reduced, uh, the, the public debt in Belgium to 80%, coming from more than 130%. That's a good thing. And I failed in... Uh, in, in, in finding a compromise on, 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 on giving voting rights to, to, to foreign people, and that caused a, a lot of trouble in, in my government. But that are practical things or concrete uh, 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 dossiers. But Guy, just quickly on that, what, what lessons did you take from what you did well and what you did badly in terms of advice for a practical politician, in terms of the technique no, of politics? The, 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 the technique, I, I don't like the word technique. Uh, so what I like in politics is rhetoric are important. Passion is important. Giving direction to society is important. Giving vision. I don't like all this stuff of pragmatism. We have to be pragmatic. And if you are pragmatic, we have a problem and we solve the problem. And okay, that's our job. No. Or for those who are living in the post-truth now, well, so there is no truth anymore. There are no facts anymore. You can invent your own facts. What we need is again a period where ideologies are important, where vision is important. What people need from politicians is direction, is vision, is hope again. There is no hope in our societies for the moment. That's a crisis of politics because hope has been destroyed. Because politicians d doesn't express any more hope and vision. I don't want from a, from a, a leader in, in politics that he knows the A, B and C of every dossier and everything. That's not necessary. He needs to give direction. People need it. Otherwise, uh, we continue to live in this post-truth uh, uh, period. So, Guy, Guy basically... So basically what you've just said, we started our conversation on Tony Blair and we've ended it on Tony Blair. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is he still candidate, Tony Blair? Because I, I have the impression that Alistair Campbell is still uh, the man behind Tony Blair who is making his speeches. But uh... <laughs> Well, it's been fantastic to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Guy, very much. Thank you for your time and I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye.